Kicking off the list at number 10, the Zanzwingdui Ruins. These ruins located in China's southwest province may just provide archaeologists clues on their past. Very recently, this past year as a matter of fact, new artifacts were found, a total of 534 relics. These cultural staples made of bronze, gold, ivory, a couple of these relics have been turning heads and raising eyebrows. This 3,000 year old bronze figure, for example, seems to be holding an ancient wine vessel. And this relic stands a little over one meter. These ruins were luckily discovered during a refurbishment of a primary school, the Sichuan Provincial Cultural Relics and Archaeology Research Institute found over 80 tombs, 60 ash pits, and 10 building zones, all of them dating back to the Western Zhou Dynasty, so back around 770 BC. Researchers have been examining the site for a couple years now, and although the people of Shu left little to no detail on their culture, we're finding all these artifacts that tell us a story. Like for example, the one pound gold mask found in one of the six sacrificial pits. So we're getting there one beautiful relic at a time. Number nine, seahorses. Ancient Chinese medicine was kind of incredible. Honestly, they had like a kind of sixth sense when it came to how certain things might work. Some of them were pretty questionable, I will say, I'm, I will not lie, but they had something right about seahorses. Even today, you can find seahorses at markets as a street snack, but beyond a tasty treat, they have been used as a part of Chinese medicine since time immemorial. It was believed that they had the potential to cure infertility, baldness, asthma, and arthritis. Research work on seahorses provided information that has the ability to help ease inflammatory symptoms associated with arthritis. A peptide derived from the seahorse species, Hippocampus cuda, proved to be effective towards chromocyte cells. So they were kind of right. It did do something. Number eight, magic mirrors. Because of horror movies, it's hard for me to open and close a bathroom mirror. I can't do it. They always do it so slow in the movies as well. I'm like, oh, just slam it. But in ancient China, mirrors were considered a good omen, actually. So much so that after a loved one passed, a mirror was often hung on the ceiling of the burial chambers, you know, to prevent evil spirits from ruining your beauty sleep. If you encountered an evil spirit, the first place you would have to go is near one of these ancient mirrors. So when archeologists found these 2000 year old ancient artifacts, one of these mirrors was still able to reflect images. The world's strongest Windex, there we go. We found more than 80 of these, so it's quite important back in the day. Inscriptions were also left on these mirrors as well, like family wealth, eternal joy, anything to preserve their memory. I would much rather have a giant mirror than a tombstone after I pass away, but it's gotta be a funhouse mirror, because any other mirror is uh, scary. And also, I can't get my hands on these ones. They're a little bit, they're slim pickings, only 80 of these. Number seven, gunpowder. Okay, sure, we all know what gunpowder is and what it does. After all, what's a soldier without his blam blam? A cowboy without his big iron, or a pirate ship without cannons? I'd argue those things are nothing without that. However, I'd like to think of a more peaceful use, and not just because YouTube sweats when I bring up pistol. I remember a long time ago where my father would get a bucket from the Shmoam Depot. He'd fill it up with sand, and we'd walk to a secluded part of the suburban area and launch fireworks. Sometimes, we'd launch them into the streets, but that depended on how much rye he had. Depends. At least there was a bucket. Safety first, right? Well, none of that would have been possible without the invention from China. Gunpowder was invented by Chinese alchemists in the 9th century. Originally, it was made by mixing elemental sulfur, charcoal, and saltpeter, potassium nitrate. The charcoal traditionally came from the willow tree, but grapevine, hazel, elder laurel, and pine cones have all been used in the process. Number six, ancient seismograph. Zhang Heng, a Chinese astronomer and a mathematician born in 78 AD, created the world's first seismoscope in 132 AD. And it's absolutely weirdly gorgeous. I mean, look at this thing. So what would happen was, Hang figured this out, that when an earthquake hit, this pendulum inside the urn would move, as do most things during an earthquake, and in turn when it picked up vibrations, it dropped a ball out of the mouth of the ancient metal dragon. The ball then falls into one of the mouths of a metal frog, making a beautiful but concerning clang sound. Now apparently the first time this happened, nobody even felt a thing, but days later, when a messenger finally arrived, it was then told that an earthquake did in fact happen. This type of ancient knowledge blows my mind, like this guy changed the world. World. Not too mysterious per se, but rather impressive how he was able to figure this out. Number five, lice. Yes, while we're talking about hair care, why not touch on the subject of lice? It's a problem everywhere, not just in your elementary school. Ancient China had lice problems just like ancient Egypt did. While almost everyone chose the path of baldness in Egypt, it was not so in China. No, other than honey locusts and rice water to clean your hair, one of the common practices to deal with lice was to, um, well, it was to eat the lice that you picked out of your hair. Hey, grub is grub, but 
I think uh, I think I'd like to move on from this topic now. Let's let's go. Let's go. Let's get the heck out. Number four, the number four, literally. Some numbers are quite lucky when it comes to Chinese culture. The number eight, for example, if you had an apartment on the eighth floor, it would sell for a higher price than that of the seventh. And no, it's not because seven, eight, nine, but rather because the number eight is pronounced ba, which sounds familiar to fa, as in fakai, which translates to becoming rich or well off. The 2008 Beijing Olympics kicked off on August 8th at 8.08 p.m., eight seconds in. It's a big deal still to this day, but the number four, on the other hand, over here is even more unlucky than the number 13. It's bad juju, the number four. It actually causes traffic to this day in Beijing. Let me explain. The number four sounds a lot like the word death, so buildings don't have this number as a floor even. It goes two, three, five. Although if you're on floor five, you know what's up. The traffic problem though, that's when it gets intense. See, Beijing has a vehicle plate program set in order to maintain the flow of traffic and also to help out with pollution. Depending on which numbers end in your plate, so on weekdays, private cars with plates ending in two digits, zero to nine, are not allowed to drive in Beijing's fifth ring road all day. So if your number is on a certain day, you need to find another route to work. Makes sense. So the lucky numbers are used more often, which means more traffic on those days, but if you had a plate ending in four, that's just 2% of all cars. You're flying to work. You're laughing on the way to work. It's easy, you're there in two minutes. Number three, earthquake detector. Earthquakes are a big problem. It's an issue in California as they're still waiting for the big one. It's a problem in Pokemon. When the gym leader I thought was going to be easy surprised me with an earthquake and like one shots my team. And it was a problem in ancient China. I've already experienced one before myself in real life, and if I had to describe to anyone what it felt like, it felt like the ground was a waterbed. Some of you are probably not going to know what a waterbed is, but that's what it felt like. Well, it was so much of an issue that Zhang Hang made the groundbreaking invention of a seismometer, a device that can detect ground movement. It can't predict them, but it can tell you where they're coming from, using vibrations and tiny balls that would fall into frog-shaped cups depending on which direction it was coming from, something that goes hand in hand with the compass from earlier. Oh, interesting. Number two. You're in trouble. We've done lists now on numerous ancient cultures, and the way that they use their natural gift of water, you know, varies. Romans would use their urine to wash their clothes, ancient Egyptians would pee on barley to predict a newborn sex. In ancient China, over 150 gallons of urine was often collected in this giant pan, and then it was boiled until it evaporated. The result was something called autumn mineral, this crystallized urine residue that's later given to patients to consume. Yummy. Urine eggs were also a thing, that's when you boil an egg for an entire day in the not so mellow yellow. When it came down to smelling good in ancient China, the wealthy would wear scented bags, but if you weren't well off, you had to wash up with urine, just as the Romans did. And last but not least, the lake of wine. A lake of wine? Sign me up! I'm in! I'm diving in! I prefer the grape variety just like King Zhou. It's tough to be a king, but he was resolved to make sure he had a damn good time. He must have loved the OG charcuterie boards because this dude ordered the construction of a pool of wine and a forest of meat. What? A pool of wine, I can imagine. A forest of meat? No idea. The pool was massive, big enough to fit several canoes. In the middle of the pool was a little island with a tree made out of skewers of meat. Creative. Uh, Zhao and his concubines would pass the time floating around the pool of wine, plucking off meat and living their best life. Sounds awesome. Honestly, I'd be in. However, his decadence didn't really please his people. Um, kind of like a Marie Antoinette deal and they began uprising and as soon as he realized this was happening instead of you know addressing it he he set himself on fire so i think his time can be summarized by trooper we're here for a good time not for a long time number 10 suck on a clove bad oral hygiene was not permitted back in ancient china bad breath even less so for example if you're going to be seeing the emperor it was required that you suck on a clove beforehand to make your breath all nice and fresh just in case. I think I'm going to use that as an insult. I'm not going to say it again because I feel like, no. Yes, I like this. Other than breath fresheners, the ancient Chinese used primitive toothbrushes made of willow branches that were rinsed clean and then chewed to make all hairy and stuff. And then dipped in some of this tooth cleaning powder made of a bunch of different ingredients like pork teeth, saponin, ginger, cooked remina glutinosa, mulu, eclipta, lotus leaf, green salt, and other things I don't want to struggle to pronounce. Okay, 
Before that though, they would also use salty warm water as a mouthwash, which would make their teeth more firm and help clean them. I actually do this uh, like every once in a while after I brush my teeth too. It's actually really good for your gums. These ancient Chinese knew what was up. Number nine, bathing. In ancient China, the etiquette of a gentleman demanded that he wash his hands five times a day, take a bath every fifth day, and wash his hair every third day. Bathing every day was a bit of a superstitious no-no, started by northern Chinese societies that would actively avoid cold water or bathing in the winter to avoid getting a cold altogether. And not bathing at all was considered barbaric, like those pesky Mongols who hated bathing and who were hated by the Chinese. Honestly, that part is, is kind of fair. They, they, they kind of sucked. So yeah, to kind of reach a nice midpoint, the norm was to wash once every five days. But that was for the nobility. The common people had access to giant bathhouses where they would go, and I mean, they could go whenever they wanted, really. I shower every morning. I have heard that's bad, but I don't think I'd willingly go for like five days without washing, so I don't know. Maybe I gotta move it to every other day. I, somebody give me advice, please. Let's move on, I, let's just move on. Number eight, rice water. So, the Chinese washed like once a week. That's fine, but how did they wash? What did they use? Well, in the beginning, it was actually common to bathe using rice water as your go-to. It would be used as both body wash and shampoo. The rice water was really good at removing oil and keeping that hair and scalp nice and beautiful as well as keeping skin nice and silky smooth. The rice water also contains starch, protein, and vitamins that are really good for us. It helped with lower back pain, frostbite, and it was really good to help relieve some of the exhaustion after a long day. Most baths are good at that, honestly. The Chinese also used honey locust that was really good for eliminating dirt and treating rheumatism and ringworm. Both rice water and honey locust were used for doing laundry as well, with honey locust keeping clothes unfaded and in good condition. As far as ancient cultures go, the Chinese are already far ahead and we're only on the 8th point. Number 7, John Wen. This kind of gives off Anastasia vibes a little. A prince thought to be alive after he was destroyed in a fire. Mm -hmm. In 1402, the main capital of Nanjing, a fire was smoldering beneath political strife. The capital was invaded by the emperor's own uncle, Zhu Di. He later accused his own nephew of being corrupted and lying to the people. Finally, the storm that had been brewing for years erupted. A rebellion was launched by his uncle with the aim of getting rid of the emperor's ministers and for Di to take power. He destroyed the palace by fire while the emperor was still inside. Three bodies were recovered from the wreckage, assumed to be the bodies of John Wen, his Empress and their eldest son. His uncle soon declared himself emperor, but the people believed that John Wen had escaped. Rumors that he smuggled out just in time and was living as a monk somewhere else in China circulated. His uncle tried to erase any trace of his legacy, but the people remembered. Just kind of like Anastasia. Yeah. Number six, combs. Yeah, some people didn't like hair, but those who deal with it made sure to keep that stuff nice and combed. Combs were all the rage. A province of China even got the nickname of the Home of Combs, which is a great name. Whether they would be made of wood, stone, or animal bone, many combs were made with care and craftsmanship. Comb shops would open up all over the show and people would carry combs as accessories. And they'd come in all sizes. Get yourself a comb for the weekends, a large comb to get all your hair at once, a comb to hold your hair in place. Heck, get a comb to help weed out those pesky lice. Number five, silk. I, for one, was always too broke to afford silk, especially after fireworks. Those bad boys are super expensive. Silk was an important thing in ancient China for the main reason that they invented the process of harvesting silk and were keeping it an ancient Chinese secret. Now, when you have a stockpile of a very valuable raw material that nobody else can get their hands on, and you have a stockpile of the finished product of which is a quality of clothing no one else can match, well, you're gonna be quite wealthy. Well, I don't need to pitch this in the Shark Tank. It's time to start selling and trading, and that's just what China did. This was a very profitable trade, so it got its own road, or roads, the Silk Road wasn't just, just one. The people who were buying from China loved it so much that they wanted their own instead of paying exuberant prices, but it took them a long time to figure out what the process actually was. They thought it grew on trees. It comes from Number four, poo poo stick. I'm sorry that we have to talk about this, but Actually, you know what, I'm not that sorry. Just as it does now, going to drop the kids off at the pool in ancient China left you with the task of cleaning yourself up afterwards. Wiping your bottom, that's what I'm talking about. Now, 
They did have paper back in ancient China, like we talked about in our ancient Chinese inventions video, but paper was expensive and the only ones who really used it were the emperor and royalty like him who would use straw paper. Before that, and for everyone else, people would use a stick-like tool called a chugi. I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Which was basically bamboo strips that were shaped to be thin and flat and slightly wide with rounded edges. Some of these even had great water absorption and a lovely scent. Those who were a bit more fortunate would then wash with water, kind of like an ancient bidet, and then use some good smelling stuff to make it all better. Other than that, a lot of people were cool with using leaves or sticks and stones, and honestly, whatever could do the trick, really. I mean, when you gotta go, you gotta go. Number three, terracotta warriors. Xin Shi Huang, who lived around 259 to 210 BCE, was not only an infamous conqueror in life, but he desired to be the same in death. He wanted to be immortalized, so he decided to build himself an immaculate tomb. It was basically an underground city guarded by the famous life-size terracotta warriors. But not only that, it was complete with gardens, stables, horses, bronze, ritual vessels, jewelry, and heaps of treasure. This immaculate piece of art represented many of the ways in which the first emperor left an impression on his civilization. During his reign, he introduced standardized currency, writing, mathematical measurements, and plenty more. He was a military genius, though his methods were basically massacres. He was credited for unifying states together. But his underground city of immortality remains one of his most mysterious footprints he left, making sure the world never forgot him even thousands of years later. Number two, water purification. While this may be considered more of a health thing than a hygiene thing, I mean, I'd argue that hygiene is health, so get at me. <laughs> the ancient Chinese discovered and made extensive use of groundwater for drinking, and they kept record of how they would keep their wells and well water nice and clean. The construction of the wells was pretty important, with the bottom of the wells regularly being dredged to keep the water clean. The inner walls of the wells were reinforced with ceramic bricks and tiles to stop that pesky soil and other impurities from falling into the water, and the openings of the wells were covered to safeguard against contamination from above the ground. The cleaning of wells was even institutionalized as a feast in some places. So cleaner water and food, it's a win-win. Knowing early on that drinking water could make them pretty sick, the Chinese boiled their water and allowed the sediment to settle before using it for cooking and drinking. They also knew what was up with water. They just knew what was up in general. It's pretty great. Okay, let's move on. I'm talking too much. Number one, no stink. Smelling funky fresh and clean was all the rage, as it should be today too. I ain't trying to be on the subway with a nose full of body odor, just as I wouldn't wish to submit anyone else to that. To be fair, not everyone knows they stanky and some people don't get a choice, but back in ancient China, those who were wealthy enough would spice up their weekly baths with roots, flowers, peppers, ginger, and all that yummy smelling goodness to basically create a lovely smelling cleansing soup to plop themselves into. Women would also carry around aromatic pouches that would just keep a nice smell around them at all times. Those who were not as wealthy would have to find other means to keep things fresh though. One that I'm not too sure would actually help smell-wise was applying their own pee-pee to their pits once a year on New Year's. This was done as a kind of uh, disinfectant. But like I said, I'm, I'm not too sure about this one, but if anyone has the knowledge, uh, firsthand or otherwise, keep it to yourself, uh, let me know, like down in the comments. I'm, I'm genuinely curious. Number 10. Tea. I honestly don't think I could make it through the day without a cup of tea in the morning. The Brit in me just can't do it. But I owe this to China. Specifically, I owe this to Chinese Emperor Shenong from way back in 2737 BC. Now listen to this story. Once upon a time, Emperor Shenong liked to drink hot water. One day, while out on a march with his army, they stopped to rest and catch their breath. At the camp, a servant was preparing Shenong's hot water when a leaf from a tree fell and landed in the water, turning it brown. Instead of discarding the new liquid, it was presented to the emperor, who drank and found it refreshing. Boom! Tea. While used as medicine before this, in the Tang Dynasty, it really became a common beverage enjoyed by many. This time period from 616 to 908 AD also saw the Book of Tea, written by Lu Yu, which contained ways to cultivate tea, tea drinking, and different classifications of tea in details. Thanks, Lu Yu. You the best. Number nine, compass. 
a vast sea all drunken sailors and maybe Jack Sparrow, depending on how long the trial lasts. We'll see how it goes. The invention of the compass hails from the ancient land to the east. I learned again today. Who, who, who'd have thought? Who, who would have thought? Not me. Way back in the Han Dynasty, the first use of the compass was accomplished with a lodestone. For those who forgot what that was from their grade four museum field trip, tis tisk. It will be on the test later, as well as some vocabulary in English. A lodestone is a naturally occurring magnet and aligns itself with the magnetic field, brother. While only used for land at first, it wasn't long before it made its way onto a boat, where it speculated it was traded off into the Islamic world and eventually the West. My only experience with the compass was in Minecraft, and it doesn't point north, it points to spawn. Boy, did I learn the hard way. Number eight, movable type printing. Fun fact, the first book with a verifiable date of printing appeared in China in the year 868, or nearly 600 years before that happened in Europe. While the printing press would come much later in Europe, the idea of being able to print identical copies without handwriting began 2,000 years ago in the Western Han Dynasty. You see, before this point, if you wanted to pass on the good word of your religion, or teach somebody something, or tell somebody about the past, or give secret little I love you notes to each other, you had to either do it by word of mouth or handwriting. <coughs> Gross. Then, in the previously mentioned Han Dynasty, people began stone tablet rubbing, which evolved into carving words and pictures onto a stone board, lathering that bad boy up with ink and pressing it onto paper. And boom, that's printing. But then, in 1041 to 1048, a guy named Bai Sheng carved characters on identical pieces of clay which he hardened by baking, resulting in pieces of movable type that could be stored and used again later. And now we have printers. Innovation, am I right? Number seven, threading. Bet you didn't know that hair was not really people's favorite thing in ancient China. I saw somewhere that they even referred to it as thread-like things of troubles. Why the hate? I don't know, but it was part of the reason monks would completely get rid of it. Other people would remove their hair too, and one way of doing that was the practice of threading. A form of hair removal that is still a thing we do today, actually. Now, I apologize if I messed this up, I've never had it done, but threading basically consists of a thin cotton or polyester thread that is doubled, then twisted, and then it's rolled over areas of unwanted hair, plucking the hair at the follicle level. In our modern day and age, it's typically used for eyebrows to shape them and keep them gorgeous. In ancient China, they would use threading to deal with facial hair, which, I mean, I guess eyebrows kind of count as facial hair, so. Threading isn't really opportune for arm or leg hair, though, so it's just a pure facial thing. Good to know. Number six, deep drilling. The province of Sichuan in ancient China, yes, like the sauce, was landlocked and about 1,200 miles from the sea. Because of that, they ain't got no sea salt. So, in order to get salt, the ancient Chinese from around the second century BC developed drilling technology to get brine from deep in the earth, which naturally forms from evaporation of ground saline water. Look at that, we're all learning today. Salt is obviously quite an important resource, but the boring and drilling technology only got better and better, resulting in more and more resources to be found, like natural gas, <laughs> which could be used as fuel. And in the 11th century, the Chinese had the technology to be able to drill those suckers up to 3,000 feet deep which is pretty deep in case you did not know. Number five, feet binding. Beauty is pain, am I right? I <laughs> know. Oh, we humans spend a lot of time trying to be attractive for one another and in ancient China, tiny feet, they were awesome. The tinier the feet, the more attractive they were. With bound feet, a woman's beauty was enhanced. Some were even bound to be 10 centimeters in size. So small. It was also a status symbol because the rich didn't need to work because as you can guess, having deformed feet prevented women from being able to leave the house. So if you were poor, you didn't bind your feet. It was a painful process. They would soak the feet in warm water mixed with herbs and animal blood. Then they would curl the toes over the sole of the foot and wrap it in cloth, breaking the toes and the arches so that it could be as small as possible. Oof. It wasn't until 1912 that it was actually banned. Number four, acupuncture. Have you ever had acupuncture done? Have you ever had acupuncture done? I've not. Neither have I. Let us know in the comments. I want to know if it actually works. When I was looking up this topic, it was called pseudoscience and said that there was no actual scientific proof that it works. Whether it does or doesn't, the practice of acupuncture is ancient. 
We know this from a less ancient book called the Nei Jing that was written around 305 BC to 204 BC and was the earliest book of Chinese medicine we know of. It was also called the classic of internal medicine of the Yellow Emperor. Who was the Yellow Emperor? Well, that would be Huang Di, whose period lasted from 2697 to 2597 BC. And this guy, this emperor, revolutionized the practice of acupuncture. So all of that was a very long, long-winded way of saying that acupuncture as a practice has been around for more than 4,722 years. Look, writing videos is hard, okay? Just give me a break. Number three, using dirt to clean? Okay, okay, not dirt, but soil. Ancient cultures, including the ancient Chinese, would use soil as a tool in cleaning, which actually had the benefit of being able to help remove oil stains. Now, how did this happen? Apparently, it is believed to be caused by the alkaline qualities of the soil that really helps with the removal of oil. Soil and oil, I did not like that. Which the Chinese actually seemed to figure out how to specifically utilize. The Chinese used a kind of natural alkali to clean their clothes, which evolved to be scented to help keep the clothes nice and funky smelling. The use of this stuff was so popular that there were tons of scented alkali stores that opened up around China, with some even becoming pretty famous. Maybe not unusual, but definitely very interesting and a precursor to modern laundry soaps. So, hmm. Number two, beer. First tea, now beer? Oh, wait, no, first beer. The earliest recorded consumption of beer was in China 9,000 years ago. I could kiss these people. Two of my favorite beverages. That's it, I'm moving back in time to ancient China. Only, this beer wasn't exactly the same as the kind of beer we would think of made of barley. They used rice, hawthorn, honey, and grapes to make their beer. This four or five percent alcohol was mentioned in inscriptions from the Shang Dynasty, so that would be 1600 BC to 1046 BC. But pottery from around 7000 BC contains traces of this same kind of alcohol. That's before even the Egyptian pharaohs, and three and a half to four thousand years before the Sumerians created the Western modern day interpretation of beer. The liquid was known as Zhu in Chinese and is often used as a spiritual offering to the heavens and the earth or to ancestors. And you know what? It still is, baby. Number one, paper money. The Zhaozi currency was the first time in history we used paper money. The stacks, the wad, the dough, the shkarol, the Benjamins, the Bordens, dead presidents, and the bread. There's no greater feeling than walking into a mall with a wad of cash, is there? JC Penny, here I come. Well, we have ancient China to thank for that. Well, sort of. Coins and metal were still more common and used for hundreds of more years before we started printing. In reality, the paper makes more sense. Before printing, coins could have been manipulated into making doubles or counterfeit. There wasn't a press yet, but with paper, it could be issued certain identifiers and used for certain things. The problem with the Jiaozi money is that it wasn't backed by anything, so it did cause a little bit of uh, what my generation knows too much, inflation. 